save money in recruitment dollars, hiring and onboarding costs can go down, new teacher induction costs can go down, mentorship and other programs specific to new teacher training, those costs can go down, termination, separation fees, and things like, you know, your professional development dollars, walking out the door every time you, you lose a teacher. So all of those can reduce our costs. Next slide. Um, maybe more important, if we think about what really matters though, is that there are a lot of really good reasons to have residencies for in teaching and learning, you get strength in instruction, student and teacher attendance, graduation rates up, college readiness up, school culture better, students staying in school, stable staffing, increased retention, strong relationships, collaborative culture, diverse teaching workforce, labor market matches, funds for enrichment and other programming that you use to spend on remediation. Um, and then there is back to economics, um, for every individual student who graduates from high school, as a result of strong teachers who wouldn't otherwise have graduated, um, that saves the country about $250,000 in expenses. It actually creates $250,000 um, over that person's lifetime. So a quarter of a million dollars for each person who is affected in that kind of way by a, a high quality teacher. So it's a really, really big deal. Um, to make residencies work, though, you need investments in three places. Two of them are upfront investments that can diminish greatly, uh, maybe even uh, be completely over time. One is the time to build a quality residency. There's lots of lots of resources on that. We're not going to go into any of that today. And the second is startup dollars to support that shift, because uh, there's a lot of shifts that have to happen to have a good, strong residency. So those are some potential areas for investment. But next slide. The most important one that we have to think about long term is this question of how can a person afford to work for a year for free in a residency? And most of us can't or couldn't have back in the day when we were doing such things. Um, why, uh, why you've got quick entry programs that are you know, just a summer or a week um, of training before somebody's a teacher of record is because people can afford to do those. They wanna become teachers, they go through those, they, they churn terribly quickly out of the system because they're not prepared. Um, they create, they destabilize schools, they create learning challenges for students because they've got an opportunity to learn gap because they don't have a teacher who knew how to teach them. Um, and people go into those programs not because they wanna fail. They go into those programs because they can't afford to teach for free. So aspiring teachers, 40% um, of undergrads, 76% of grads work full time, 20% of those have children. Um, debt, uh, the teachers incur the same amount of debt as everyone else, but they have less pay. And so paying off their debt is a, stress, a stressor. College costs are mostly not tuition, they're living expenses. And so funding somebody to be able to live while they're doing the residency is really the highest priority. And then finally, um, we have a real problem in terms of access because candidates who are in teacher preparation programs who are white come from family backgrounds of about $90,000 on average. And uh, uh, I'm sorry, aspiring teachers who are teachers of color come from family backgrounds of less than half of that income level. And so they're not able to work for free, essentially. Next slide. Um, Francesca and Divya on our team here uh, led a national survey where students talked about their financial debt. And I just want to share um, three slides, three, three quotes with you, because I think they're super, super telling quotes. Um, when candidates don't have financial supports, they have problems with mental health and debt. When candidates don't have financial supports um, and universities tell them you can't do it, you can't work while you're student teaching because you need to focus on student teaching, um, then they can't meet their responsibilities. And finally, um, the quote that we often use is, if the financial constraints were lifted, I believe we would see the diversity that we desperately need in education. So prepared to teach completely agrees with that last statement and all of those really human pieces that go behind the people that want to join our profession. They deserve to be supported so they can spend the time learning how to teach well and that's what we're after here. So next slide. So an ESSER investment can help you flip a system towards funded residencies. 
We're not going to go into all of the details on this. There's a later webinar in the week that's going to talk a little bit more about some of these things. But basically speaking, if you take a look at what I've got here is year one and it goes through year five, acknowledging that the ESSER dollars are only available through year four of this particular model, um, you can have a school-based instructional roles kind of a, a position like a substitute teaching and you can pay portions of this stipend that is needed to residents in year one from that kind of adjustment. Um, and then that light, that, that white box, um, that's unfunded. So ESSER and other outside investments could close the gap so you could actually have a resident stipend that was at a level that somebody could afford to live on. That's our goal at that 100% bar. In year two, you can add a few more kinds of um, other sorts of resources, like maybe you figured out some ways to change your professional development spending. Maybe you figured out some ways to readjust staffing in schools so that some of the other sorts of dollars that are used for instruction in schools can be brought to the residents who are doing instructional roles. Um, by year three, you see that the amount of ESSER funding needed it has really decreased quite a bit, partly because you've got residents who are now staying in the system. And so you're getting turnover savings. In addition, of course, you get reduced remediation retention dollars that are also being saved. So that by year four, the end of the ESSER funds, um, you, you, you have a little bit of gap there, but it's a gap that's probably manageable. And then by the time you flipped your whole system and you really have changed your turnover problems, uh, you've gotten rid of your turnover problems, there's actually quite a bit of potential funding that could be brought to residencies. The problem has always been that people can't get to that um, initial investment in year one, so they're not able to attract enough people at the low level of stipend that they have. So the ESSER funds can help bridge that gap. And now I'm going to turn it over to our ESSER workhorse, Hannah. All right, great, Karen. Thank you so much for the background on teacher residencies. Now we're going to get in a bit more on how and why ARP funds can really be used as a catalyst for, um, for sustainably funded teacher residencies. Charlotte, if you want to click to the next slide. Um, so the primary goals of the American Rescue Plan are to address the impacts of pandemics in the schools. Um, we want to address opportunity gaps that COVID-19 has exacerbated and really dig into the disproportionate impact um, that COVID-19 has had on different student populations. Uh, if you wanna to click to the next slide, Charlotte. Uh, paid uh, residents in paid residents integrated into their clinical site for a full year allow residents to support student learning in numerous capacities related to addressing learning loss and supporting efforts to address the impacts of the pandemic. Um, and when we talk about learning loss here, we really don't want to put uh, the weight of the burden on the child, but really focusing on um, the opportunity gaps uh, that were exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, ARP ESSER funds can be used uh, towards previously legislated ESSA, IDEA, e, uh, AEFLA, and Perkins CTE supports and activities um, specifically addressing learning loss through evidence-based interventions. And residents really are evident, residencies really are evidence-based interventions. Uh, residents uh, present in the classroom uh, a shift in the adult learner ratio and are able to work with their mentor teacher using strategies like co-teaching and uh, group teaching to provide students with more individualized learning. Uh, residencies help really prepare a diverse group of uh, super prepared new teachers and uh, can also be used to support extracurricular and after school supports. Uh, so now a little bit more about the nuts and bolts of how the funds distributed are distributed. They are going to be according to the Title I formula and we are going to share in the chat um, 
how these will disperse into each state. So that is how, um, Oh, I see Steph. Steph is chatting. Great. Um, so ARP funds are dispersed according to the Title I formula. While these are one-time funds, uh, we believe residencies are a really great opportunity to be able to uh, use these one-time funds for sustainable, long-lasting change. At least 90% is going di directly to the LEAs, up to 93%. Two-thirds have already been distributed automatically, and the states must apply for remaining one-third. Uh, the applications are due June 7th, and throughout the process, there must be stakeholder engagement. Um, so that is part of why you're here today, is that we really want to help inform some of that stakeholder engagement. And um, another quick fact, the funds must be used by September 30th, 2024. So we have a window of opportunity to be able to push forward residencies. Uh, some of the high leverage spending areas or some of the models that we would suggest uh, would be using, co uh, using the funds to fund co-teaching stipends to residents, um, using them for mentor stipends to the teachers of record to really honor the work that mentors are doing uh, to help bring new professionals into the teaching profession, and then also supporting mentor professional development and instructional support roles. So really, we want to talk about some of these next steps. So uh, Prepare to Teach has um, made a, a recommended, um, has written some recommended language for you to be able to send to your various state education agencies um, and um, to be able to really plug in these paragraphs about including residencies. We know that the state applications are going to be much larger than just residencies. Some LEAs will still need to be potentially buying PPE or upgrading their air filtration, uh, doing other things that are very important. Um, in order to protect students and teachers. Um, so when we are asking the states to put this into um, their guidance, we really want to open up the, um, the opportunity for LEAs to be able to invest in residencies as it makes sense for them. Um, a second step would be to comment on the federal register. So we are going um, to write a very thorough comment on the federal register. And um, we would love for people to join us in that. And you can send um, in our comments along with a note about why uh, you think that teacher residencies would really um, benefit uh, the nation at this point. And then we can also activate each of our own networks. So we can share this webinar information, convene other stakeholders, um, and really rally support behind residencies. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I think I've got the first one here from Nicole. Yeah. Um, in the UT system. Hi, Nicole. How are you doing? Um, yeah, we've got a lot of information about the costs of turnover. So, Steph, can you rechat the Money Matters? So, Money Matters is a document that gives you an awful lot of information about high level research, including like retention data from residencies. Um, that's a really, and, and the, the challenges of candidates to be able to work for free while they're learning to teach. So that's a document that's, that is sort of user-friendly to just give to somebody as a quick overview of why this is important. Um, in addition, um, I'm wondering, Charlotte, do you think, or Gretchen, I know I, Gretchen just popped off. Divya, do you think you might be able to, oh, there's, there's Gretchen. Do you think you can share screen um, on, the, um, on the tool that's on the website? And then Steph, if you can find the link and chat it, that'd be great. We have a, a free tool that just got released a, a week ago, 
a couple of weeks ago um, that helps districts actually do real calculations on their own numbers of what a residency might cost and what the ultimate cost savings could be for them. Either they can punch in uh, national numbers or they can use their own actual numbers. I'm just pulling that up for, for everybody to see. Um, so I will share my screen. And while she's doing that, Yvette, the session's an hour. All right, can everybody see that? Great. Um, so this is our resources page. And as Karen mentioned, there are calculators here um, and the, the P12 residency funding calculator is um, the one that she was referring to, I believe. And you can um, see that here. You can, you can scroll through it right on our website to get an idea of what it looks like. You can also open it in a separate tab to really work through it. It's very um, in depth with budget. So we, we recommend going through it when you have your budget handy. Um, and I will just do a very quick little demo here so that everybody can see how it works. So there's some information up top just about what the tool does, um, what you might need to have with you, and then going into things like enrollment of residents. So for example, um, we're looking at a five-year plan in this tool. You can, you can, you know, do anywhere from one to five years. You're going to get the most information if you're using, obviously, more years to project out. Um, you can add different levels of enrollment for those years. You can see that the, the graph on the right is adjusting automatically. Um, and then you can go through and add a funding level for mentors and residents so that you get a little breakdown of how much you'll need to fund. Um, so that's just the introductory part. And then it actually gets into different ways to um, adjust funding or reallocate funding from substitute teaching, paraprofessional lines, extended day, extended year, um, floating coverage, those kinds of things. And then there's another section for savings from uh, lowered turnover. So things like hiring and onboarding recruitment that if you have residency trained teachers who stay in the classroom for longer, they will um, not you know, be leaving and causing that churn that often comes with a very high cost. Um, once you go through the calculator, you will get a full summary of all of your funding needs. So this will all populate with a nice little graph um, and a table so that you can save that as a PDF and bring it with you for planning purposes or presentation purposes. So um, we definitely encourage people to use this tool. Um, it is here as a resource for everybody. And I will just throw it back to Karen. Is there anything else specific that you wanna go through on here or is that? No, nope, I think that that does it. Anything anything else related to that question of the, the costs to the district? And then Matt, I saw a question from you, there you go. Um, strategies are, so lots of people are saying get those ESSER dollars, right? Totally true. Um, just as an, an FYI, and, and Hannah, I think it might be helpful to go ahead and chat that the document that you showed, um, I don't think they have a link for that. They got a link to the actual federal, federal register, but not to the document, or, or maybe it was when my screen was jumping back and forth, um, but chatting the document that's got the, the language that you might use with your state. Um, that language is intended to make it possible for your districts to be able to use their dollars for residencies. If your state does not say it's an eligible use, then your, your districts may not be able to use the dollars even if they wanted to. So that's the important piece there. So you want your state to add these nice, easy paragraphs into their application for that last third of funds so that then when you are having those conversations, Matt, which we'll turn to now, when you are having those conversations, it is actually technically possible for them to fund residents. So not every state gets that vision. Um, and we, we found this out during ESSA, when ESSA came through, states that actually wrote in the language were able to promote funded residencies much more easily than states that just said, oh yeah, it aligns and so they can if they want to. And then when it came, push came to shove, districts were not able to. So be sure that your state does get that language written in. 
Um, so are there strategies for building a real understanding of the unique benefit analysis of focusing these funds towards residencies particularly? and in relationship to other competing uses of these funds. So I think that there are two things from our perspective and we would welcome people unmuting and saying things that they've thought about that make this particularly compelling. So as that chart that I showed you that had the large white bars and then those white bars got smaller, this is actually an investment that can be maintained. So there are ways to integrate residencies into existing district processes that will allow these residencies not to need continuing funding. They might need some, it's true. But by and large, you can get a lot of your resident stipend funded if you do the investments up front. That's not the case for many of the individual investments that will happen as a result of the ESSER dollars. Individual investments are needed. We've had a pandemic. It's a crisis, right? Those are needed, but they aren't necessarily going to shift the system to, as is said, build back better. Whereas the shift towards something that can be maintained and will have long-term impacts beyond the, the, the grant funding period, residencies do that. And very few of the one-off programs do that. So that's one of the pieces. Um, and then the other competing use of the funds, there are many things that are required, like tutoring, and residents can absolutely be tutors at the side of the class for three hours a day, right? So they're still in the classroom, but they're providing that one-on-one -on -one instruction, and they're getting the money for tutoring while they're in there. So there are ways in which it doesn't necessarily always have to compete with other priorities if we design our residencies in this interim period to also um, meet some of the other required needs um, in the ESSER funding guidance. Is that helpful, Matt? Yeah, very helpful. It's, and that's, that it's really helpful just in terms of it's, it's the message almost as much as it is the opportunity, um, just because I think districts are getting somewhat bombarded by, by the potential of these funds and, and, and different ideas about ways to use them. And so this idea about sustainability, um, long-term sustainability, and also leveraging with what the funds are already intended to do by utilizing um, residents who are very capable in those roles, I think are, are two really helpful approaches. Great. Anybody else have other ideas of how this um, argument works for districts? Most importantly, I know we have district folks on this call. Um, any district or state folks um, who have some ideas about where the challenges are and where we're a little too pie in the sky and need to think more or, or get our argument more clear? So Yvette, um, I see that you're in the very beginning stages of the discussion. Um, Congratulations for starting, that's great. Um, I think that one of the things we would really rec strongly recommend um, is that those discussions be as, um, as broad as possible. Um, and, and actually, Charlotte, can you chat um, Western Washington University's case study? Um, and maybe the going further together case study, that those, the people in those discussions be like really a broad swath of folks. Um, if, if you go to just HR, um, I'm, I'm doing some unfair predicting now, but if you go to just HR, you're gonna get one of two responses. We can't do that, or my God, we need to do more of it, but nobody will help me out. Um, because the HR is one place, right? Teaching and learning is over here. Um, and if you go over here in teaching and learning, they're not going to be able to tap into the things that HR is working. They'll feel like they're at cross purposes. And if you don't have the union in, um, if you don't have mentor teachers in to help them understand that this is different from student teaching, um, all of those sort of key players make for a stronger conversation. There are a lot of resources about how to do the, the building of these programs. And we, we know Pretty, not by any um, scientific sample, but by 100% of the universe that we happen to have sampled, um, it's actually easier to build the kind of program that is the future vision of what we want this world to look like without having grant funds that are going to fall off, unless when you have the grant funds, you start talking about sustainability. 
And so my suggestion to you would be in those conversations to center and what does it look like in five years? Where are we coming? You know, what have, what have been the benefits? Where have we been able to save money? Because if you don't do that kind of work, you might as well have had a TQP grant and then it closes and then you have to close the program. Yeah, Karen, this is Yvette. Uh, thank you for that. We have also here at the service center, there are, there are 20 education service centers in Texas and we support the San Antonio region. Um, and so uh, we have also worked with public impact in the past in their opportunity culture model, which is really in, in some ways similar in that we had to get districts all at the table, various stakeholders at the table to talk about how, how we increase teacher support using existing, fund, uh, existing funding sources. So reallocating paraprofessional staff, reallocating teaching positions, et cetera. So we've done some of that kind of work here on behalf of the Texas Education Agency. Um, but for us as an EP, um, this, is the, this is the very beginning for us to re-image our program and what it might look like using some of those ideas that come from public impacts work. I will look at the going further together in these other documents you guys have sent and I appreciate uh, this conversation. Great. So um, now that I know that you're one of the, the Texas regional providers um, and you already have done that kind of, uh, the, the two that I gave you are really about building these, these coalitions, right? And so you, you, I know you guys have already done that with Public Impact. Um, we have a whole set of resources on the website. I believe that Hannah's last slide has those, which are both other reports um, and things like the tool that you just saw. So there's a lot of other information in addition to those. Those two are really about building the coalition more so than the nuts and bolts. Yeah, Hannah, do you wanna sort of share that document a little bit um, in, in like the paragraphs? Maybe it would be helpful for folks to be able to see what those look like. So this is um, sample language. Um, I think there's a chat, there's a link somewhere in the chat to probably a PDF, which we need to get you a we need to get you a word document so you can change it for your own state. Um, folks in New York, there is a set of this uh, sort of wordsmithing on this document um, inside New York. So don't worry about doing it yourself because that'll come out to all the New York um, folks on our P20 collaborative. Um, but here in this document that I think Hannah's trying to pull up. Yeah, I uh, am realizing that our links got a little bit crossed. So I will pull up the state document and uh, we'll be sure to- I think I've got it. Appropriate link. There we go. So uh, this document directly maps with the ARP application. So it shows how teacher residencies can be used for all of the different goals and answer all of the questions uh, that are posed to the state education agencies. So we have an introduction um, uh, to the language and then we use the structure of the application to create the rest of the document. So we have here six different paragraphs responding directly to the USDOE language around uh, what ARP funds uh, can and should be used for. So just you can sort of just see that we're just providing some boilerplate language that should work. And again, all our goal is in this document is for every state to be sure that districts have the capacity to use these dollars. In Hannah's presentation, she talked about the overall goals of ESSER, which are slightly more broad um, than the district level ESSER dollar usage. Um, so these are, th this aligns to the district level ESSER dollar usage. There is a whole other set of funding that states would have. And that to us would make a lot of sense if states uh, did something like created a community of practice within the state to support the development of these um, high quality residencies. So that would be a different funding stream, the state level dollars from ESSER. Oh, 
Other questions? Right. Um, so Janet's not uploaded yet. This is um, this is all very much in real time. This this webinar was put together in a week, with all this research and resource working behind it, uh, because time is of the essence in order for us to get these pieces out so people can use them. So the hope was that we were going to share them all with you today, but I think it's going to be tomorrow. So everybody who's participating, um, assuming that you registered, if you didn't register, be sure you chat your email um, to Hannah. Um, everybody's going to be getting a link to a folder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and within that folder will include um, any resources that we chatted out today, uh, USDOE guidance, um, a re recording of this webinar in case you want to send it all along to any partners as you might find useful, our presentation materials today, um, anything that you might need uh, to be able to speak to this opportunity with your partnerships. We can pause once more if there's any more burning questions. And uh, if not, we will let you know that we have upcoming webinars going in deeper. Um, tomorrow, we will have an overview of all of the different reports and resources that are have come out, um, as well as going deeper into role reallocation uh, through partnership um, in order to make simple shifts. And that can really help uh, start getting some of those sustainable dollars. Um, May 19th, we have um, an IHE focused or prep program focused um, webinar on reducing costs for teacher candidates. May 21st, uh, we're talking about reinvesting into residencies. Uh, we also have uh, these tools listed and we will um, have, I mean, these, of course, linked as well um, in the PowerPoint that you all get. <laughs>